No. Well, Just let me know when you're rolling. Yeah, hang on a second. Okay. Okay. I'm going to have you start by saying and spelling your complete name. Now, do you want my formal or what I go by? Both. Okay. My formal name is Nathan, N-A-T-H-A-N, middle initial E, Morell, M-O-R-R-E-L-L. -L. But I go by Nate, N-A-T-E. Okay. And the unit that you served in in the 10th Mountain Division? I started out with C Company of the 86th Regiment. Then I went to 10th Recon. And then we went to MTG. And then to Company A of the 10th Medical Battalion. And how did you serve during your time at the 10th Mountain Division? Uh, second Lieutenant. Okay, very good. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you came to serve in the 10th Mountain Division? Mm, that's easy. Okay, Kai. Can you tell me how you came to serve in the 10th? Right. Uh, during World War II, everybody that did any skiing was knew that the 10th Mountain Division was being formed, so we all wanted to join it. And I did the same as everybody else, got three letters of recommendation. And uh, then just prior to my going into service, I was certified as a, a professional ski instructor. So that helped. Who gave you your three letters of recommendation? Oh. Uh, Beno Rubeska from Hannah Schneider Ski School. Uh, hmm, one of the, I can't think of his, yeah, I can't, Kerr, uh, was his last name. He was from over in Vermont. And I've forgotten the third one, but I think it might have been Sepp Rusch. Do you know what was in your letters of recommendation? Oh, in the letters of recommendation? Yeah. They just, uh, just said that he would be a good... So oh, Heinrich Schneider was the other one in the letter of recommendation rather than Sepp Ruth. No, it was Heinrich Schneider. And because I had certified in his, and worked in a ski school for two years, well, I, uh, it was no problem. Um, can you talk a little bit about the quality of the officers that you met when you were over at Hale and MTG? The quality of the officers that we had at Hale were varied. Some good, some not so good. What were the good ones like? All oh, the good ones, well, one name comes immediately to mind would be Johnny Wooded. Uh, most of the men were good. The ones that weren't were, we used to call them 90 day wonders. They'd been to OCS and they had been indoctrinated in how they should conduct themselves as an officer. Uh, that left a lot to be desired. So we had to train them a little bit. Once that they got up to the division, then they found out that some things worked and some didn't. What stood out about John Woodward being an outstanding officer? Well, John Woodward had been in the military longer than most of us. I believe he was a captain at the time that I knew him first. Uh, if you know John Woodard, you'd know why he was a good officer. He was a fair man, and he knew his business. He knew what he was doing, and uh, he didn't give you a hard time. He was uh, he was just playing good man all the way around. It was just like Bob Dole. He went out. He came out of OCS, came with the division, but he was a solid citizen and well liked by his troops. He was a, a leader would be the way to, I think, describe what uh, John Woodard was. He was a leader. He wasn't, uh, and you can take all of the uh, good things that you can say about a leader to those two men that I just mentioned. Tell me a little bit about what your life was like at Camp Hale. I thought it was pretty good. Death Camp Hale. Uh, we, I never, I went up there for basic training, but we also had to train a lot of the soldiers because they weren't skiers. 
So in the middle of my basic training, I was called out and went up to Cooper Hill. And I spent the rest of the winter up there teaching skiing. So I never finished basic training. So my experience at Camp Hale is quite a bit different than most every other soldier. Uh, I got the usual army, you know, you go in and you get issued your clothing that almost fits and uh, you get your gear that's pretty good. And, but I did have my own ski boots up there that we were allowed to, to wear those. Spent eight hours a day teaching. Well, eight hours, we were out there eight hours, probably near six hours a day of actual. Cooper Hill was good because we had a tea bar there. And even though I was still young, I was only 19 years old, I had experience as an instructor. So I got some of the better classes that uh, rode the tea bar. Didn't have to climb so much. Other things at Camp Hale, of course, you had to get accustomed to the elevation because we were 9,500 feet at the camp itself. And they gave you 17 days of limited duty to acclimate yourself, which is what we did. When the skiing was over and I came back to Camp Hale, I was going to go to a non com school. But they asked me if I wanted to go down to MTG. No. Those days it was 10th uh, Recon. So I asked what we would be doing and they said, well, you'll be rock climbing and teaching it. And most of us said, well, what's a rock? Because we were not uh, proficient in that. Most of us had not done any of that. But we had men such as Paul Petzold, who incidentally was uh, born about 20 miles away from Fort Drum. Uh, he was in the group. And then we had, uh, oh, who's the fellow out? Hmm, Tap Tapley. Uh, he was one of Paul Petzold's uh, protégés. We had a lot of good mountaineering men, so we did learn, and they just moved us right down to where the rocks were, and we lived in pop tents all during the warm weather. So at night you didn't have any place to go or anything to do except sit around a campfire and learn from what these other fellows had experienced in life. So it was tremendous. And uh, so we, we taught for that summer and then came fall and right back to Cooper Hill. I started skiing there on October, well, what's Halloween? 30th? 31st. 31st of October. And I didn't quit until next May. I had had enough of skiing. At that point, they took those of us that were qualified as mountaineering instructors, they called it, and sent us to West Virginia. And that was TDY, temporary duty. And we climbed on the Seneca Rocks and taught other divisions how to survive in the mountains. And also what to do if you get bitten by a rattlesnake, because that they did have down there, that and copperheads. Then when D-Day happened, I remember I was on Canaan Mountain, and uh, when we came in that night, they told us that it was D-Day, June 6th. And the people we were, or the divisions we were teaching, wanted us to go with them. We didn't want to. We wanted to go back to the 10th. So we were in 10 or 11 different units on paper in the next two or three days. And finally, with political pressure, we got back to Camp Swift, Texas, where the division had been moved to. So when I got there, uh, that's when I joined the medics, because one of my students was a, a medical officer, doctor, and he'd said that if I ever, if the units ever split up, come on down, he'd have a place for me. And I was a buck sergeant at that time. So down I went, and yes, I did. And I became a mule skinner at that point. Uh, Texas, we didn't like. It was hot, sandy, uh, still training. We'd been training for almost two years at that point, And we're getting quite discouraged. And then George Hayes appeared. He'd been 
called back to the States. He'd been with the 2nd Division. He was artillery commander in Europe. And he took over the division. And he told us that we were going overseas. So I had applied for uh, ordinance OCS, 90 day wonder school. And I just said, forget it, I passed. And I said, I don't want to go, I'll stay with the division. So I went with the division to Italy. What was your favorite training experience over at Camp Hale? Favorite training experience would have been going from Leadville, Colorado to Aspen, Colorado over snow. Uh, we carried, I believe we weighed them out at 70 pounds, the packs. It was an experimental thing. A Lieutenant Russ McJury was the officer in charge of that deal. I forgot the number of men that went. But uh, I would say there were 30 or 40 of us. Now they had already done this in the summer months. And you just took a compass course, you had no trails, you had nothing, you just bushwhacked. So three and a half days from the time we left Leadville, we were in Aspen. And because we were a day and a half ahead of time, we got to ski Aspen. So it was a good trip because we learned a lot. That's why Paul Petzold disagreed with Lieutenant McJury, Russ McJury, and uh, said we shouldn't go up a certain snowfield. McJury said we should, and the agreement came that Paul Petzold could go where he wanted to go and take whoever he wanted to take, and the same went for McJury. You can see the kind of a military unit this was. It wasn't cut and dry. You'd do it or else. So. Paul Petzl went up an old avalanche track, and the jury went out right across a snowfield that could have avalanched. I went with him. It didn't avalanche, but it could have been disastrous. So we were still in the learning stage, but that was an excellent that was an excellent uh, mission there. What were the conditions like on that particular training track? Oh, we had lots of snow. We started out by ski joring behind weasels and we got in as far as we could when the snow got too deep and the weasels couldn't travel then we went we skied the rest of the way the some of troops took five days to do what we did in three and a half uh, you would climb all day long we crossed the continental divide at least once and i think it was more than twice. I, it's hard to tell because we have no maps of where we went. It, uh, that's one of the disappointments of, of that trip that we didn't uh, have a better record of what was done. We were climbing on skis? Oh yeah, yes, yeah. yeah we, had the, we had our skis, uh, your packs, no snowshoes, and we had four-man tents, as I remember it. In fact, I know it is. Well, the first night, we had just gotten into uh, timber growth. And we heard a boom. And we thought it was artillery. And then we realized it was an avalanche. And it came within less than 100 feet of us on one edge of it. And then turned and went down below us. So we thought, well, that's the end of that. that. That won't happen again. You don't get two avalanches in a row. So we went to bed in the middle of the night. We heard another boom because it was what they called a shelf. The snow built up in a drift up on the top and just stuck right out there like your fingers sticking out. And when it got too heavy, it broke off. And then as it fell, it caused an avalanche. So that was pretty good just for the first day. And you could go out and walk on where the avalanche had been and uh, hardly leave a footprint. The snows are that compacted. Nobody got was in it. If they had been, you know, you'd have only had about 10 minutes to get them out. If you can find them. And we were all, everybody was without their skis on, so it would have been a difficult maneuver. 
But the next morning we got up and prepared our food and got out. And in those days, oh, a beautiful sunny day. I think it was March. Colorado in March is beautiful. Um, so we skied. Then the second night, I can't even remember where we bivouacked. And then uh, the half a day that it took us to get in to Aspen was mostly downhill. It was many miles, but uh, we were just cross-country skiing and and uh, downhill, so it was easy. Then we stayed at the uh, hmm, can't think of the name of the hotel in Jerome Jerome Hotel in Aspen, and it cost us fifty cents a night per person, so that wasn't too bad. How fit were you guys? Well, uh, chew spikes and spit nails. Yeah, we were we were in good shape. No better than what the troops are today, though, because they are fit. Uh, yeah, we. I think of what I am today and what I was then, and what a difference. Yeah, no, it, uh, there wasn't any other military unit that would physically be as well trained as we were. Maybe with the exception of rangers or paratroopers or somebody, but even there, we had when. The 87th went to Kiska. We had Marine officers go along with us, and they said there wasn't a Marine unit that could have done what the 87th did. So we were in better condition than the Marines. Um, did you feel like you were in the Army, or did it feel like play? Because you were doing something you loved anyway. What were the feelings of, was it play or was it army? It was some of each. You had to follow them, you know. You could only go on past, you could do pull KP, you did all of the army things, but uh, it was something that you wanted to do. Like, now Chap Chapley every weekend he'd go out hunting with his bow and arrow. And it, uh, so he was having a good time. How hard is it to make skiers into good soldiers? To make a skier a real hard and fast civilian into a soldier, most skiers are quite independent in their thinking. I would say that uh, these people went along with the army, but they continually were judging. Uh, and they didn't hesitate to tell an officer if they were an enlisted man if he was doing something wrong. Now when I was in West Virginia I stopped to, uh, I guess I don't know what you'd call it. It was battalion strength. We were in the, uh, we called it the, uh, hmm. the big ditch that's out there, the well, anyway, it's a very, very deep uh, canyon, Grand Canyon. Now we got it. It's the Grand Canyon of West Virginia, so you can. That gives you a little idea of what it would be like. And but it was forested. It wasn't like the one out west. So we got down to the bottom to cross the stream, which we'd been teaching them how to do. And we had flash floods, thunderstorms. Well, you don't, they'd already drowned some people trying to do this before. And I can remember that I told the colonel he couldn't go across, and I was a corporal at the time. And he chewed me out, but my rank held because I was a mountaineer instructor. <coughs> oh, pardon me. The, uh, <coughs> but that was the type of a unit we were there to do what was right and just to follow an order because someone gave it didn't always happen tried to but uh, and I'm sure in combat that uh, <clears throat> the men were <coughs> pardon me the uh, enlisted men were listened to 
the uh, I know we have a man by the name of Hugh Evans that uh, well, they were out upon Tomigan and they had a new officer that had just come in from Hawaii I think from the 27th division and he didn't know what he was doing and he set too fast a pace and then Hugh Evans went up and told him so. Hugh was a sergeant. Well, Hugh, I believe, lost his stripes, got transferred to another company, uh, but later on was vindicated. The boys didn't lack for courage, intestinal fortitude to do what was right. And uh, a good, well, when you think that the uh, IQ of the division was the highest in all military services. If I was, I had a bunkmate that was a PhD, that was a PFC, and he did not want to be anything else. He said when he got out, then he'd worry, he'd go back to teaching. Well, how hard is it to make soldiers into skiers? We had uh, a lot of soldiers at one point come into us that had to be taught skiing. That's no big problem to make a military skier out of them, with the exception that uh, some of them might not want to be there. I think we better stop a minute. Can you hear the pump running? Mm -hmm. Check one thing. So far, so good? So far, so great. Far, so good. Very yep. great. Okay. <coughs> oh, pardon me. I can keep that in my hand. Yeah. Uh, what was the hardest part about training non-skiers to be skiers? To train a non-skier to be a skier, you had to have the men willing and wanting to learn how to ski. Now most of them did. Most of them fought it when they first got there, what am I doing here? But they turned into skiers and skied the rest of their life. So the hardest part? We're just getting their mindset. Physically, they were in good shape. They could do it. How about teaching brass? Rock climbing or skiing? Well, I usually had an officer's class. And again, the white stripe we had on our arm, we had as much rank as they did. And they had to follow what we did. And they, those were a lot of them were non-skiers. The brass, a lot of times were, were fresh out of college, but had not skied, or they were in medical school and they were now in the army to be doctors. Did it result in some pretty spectacular crashes? Oh, they wiped out pretty once. Once in a while they would, uh, yes. Uh, of course we had some of our own too, although even at that point, the ones of us that had skied and, and taught in civilian life, we kept track of the number of falls we had every year, so we did the same thing out there. But not for our students. They, uh, <laughs> our students, uh, we used to call them egg beaters. That's what that looked like. So, yes. They'd, uh, What's an egg beater fall? Describe an egg beater fall for me. Oh, an egg beater fall. How do you describe it? Well, that's when everything goes wrong and he probably falls forward over the tips of his skis and then rolls just like you do a hand egg beater looks like those would be the ones that didn't realize well you had to teach falling and uh, you didn't want to fall with the pack on because that could come up if you didn't have your belly band on and hit you right in the back of the head and if it weighs 70 pounds, uh, it could hurt. To ski with a pack, that was a change, even no matter who you were. And uh, once you got used to it, it was hard to get to ski without it. Tell me more about the challenges of skiing on the, the trek between uh, Leadville and Aspen. What were the hardest parts about that particular maneuver? 
on the trip we took from Leadville to Aspen, the hardest parts were pure physical work because you were, you're, you're climbing with all your gear, you're climbing in soft snow, so somebody's got to go ahead and break trail. We'd swap off on that. Uh, then you get tired. And I can remember one day skiing down when we just crossed the Continental Divide. And I knew that I couldn't hold it. I could ski it, but when it came to stopping, I just sort of did a half Christy and let her go. <laughs> and you would, you know, you could control your fall. Uh, militarily, you had to learn how to fall so you could be in a, in a firing position. Uh, we didn't teach too much of that at the Cooper Hill area. That was done at the unit level. What elevations were there between Leadville and Aspen? Oh, well, we started out from Cooper Hill at 10-4, 10,400 feet. Uh, we went probably down to about uh, 10,000 as we crossed the valley. And the Continental Divide runs pretty close to 12,000 feet. So we, we tried to pick the saddles and not get over 12, maybe 13. I've forgotten what the elevation is in Aspen, but uh, the top of the mountains were pretty high. Did you really know where you were going or how you were going to get there? Well, we knew that we had a compass heading. We had maps and we followed contour, you know, the contour maps. And yeah, you, you know where you were all the time. But we never recorded that trip. That's the pathetic part of that one. Were there some <clears throat> surprises when the contours on the map, when you got to look at what the reality was of what's really in front of you compared to what seemed like maybe a great path on the map? Contour maps that we had were good. And uh, you could tell where the steep, you could tell your passes, tell your forestated areas. So no, those were good. They, and we had all taken map reading prior to, but that was an officer's job. Uh, I'm sure that most of us, if they'd told us to take off and go to Aspen, we would have looked on a map and said, well, that's such and such a heading. And we'd have gone. Of course, we were young, we didn't know any better. When you figure it out, time I took that trip, I was just 20 years old. And when you look at 20 year olds today, they look awfully young. And 19 year olds, 18, 19, which is a good many of us went into the service at that age. It's, we've got them now today in the Army in those ages. And the Army toughens them up. And especially if they're going to Iraq or if they went to Afghanistan, them in. They've, they've changed. What was the funniest part of that trip to Aspen? The funniest part was probably the night we discovered that Bud Winters had mixed all our food up to save weight so he could throw away the, the packaging. And uh, we all got on to his case. I guess we ate the food, but uh, that wasn't one of Bud's better days. <laughs> we did go fairly close to where the, the cabin is out there on the 10th Mountain Trail. Uh, we all knew that, and his camp was, was built fairly close to where we traveled by. But that's all we know. Um, when you were at Seneca Rocks, does that mean you missed out on D-Series? D-Series? No. But because I was, was up at Cooper Hill, not assigned to a regular company, I was the enemy. So we got to sleep most nights in the barracks. We'd go out on patrol and harass the troops and then disappear. And we disappeared back to the barracks. We didn't have to stay. I didn't spend many nights at all out on D-Series. I was very fortunate. What did you do to harass the troops? Oh, it would be See, we had blank ammunition, so 
uh, when you have a, a, an exercise like that, you would, uh, you've got umpires that say, well, this is what's happened. And we'd get in close to where somebody was bivouacked. I'll wait, sometimes it'd be early in the morning. And uh, then we'd open fire with a blank ammunition and see them all scrambling to come out from their sleeping bags. And, uh, some of the boys, I didn't get in on this one, but some of them uh, actually went in and captured some of the sentries. And then it also worked the other way that they captured some of the enemy. That wasn't so good because they really gave us our hard time. <clears throat> I guess because you had greater expertise, they, you thought they should not have been able to? Well, uh, they thought that it was pretty funny to make a stockade for you, keep you up all night, and uh, uh, if you would have happened to get into one of the streams like one of the boys did, that wasn't too comfortable. But we survived. What was the most dangerous situation you faced in training? The most dangerous part of my training, I was fortunate because rock climbing and so on, you know, you could get, you could get killed pretty easy. But we had such excellent instructors and experienced mountaineers there that safety was always utmost in our mind. So even though we got in tight spots, we got out of them because everybody worked together. When we were in West Virginia, <coughs> pardon me, the, uh, we stood at the bottom of one of the rocks there and we would have three teams climbing all at once and we had a uh, PA system to talk to them. And we didn't lose any of those fellows. And they were flatland divisions we were training. So the division safety wise was excellent uh, record. One man fell, he lost an arm, and that's about it. We never killed anybody in training. Did you prefer to be out training or prefer to be in camp? I prefer to be outside. In my total military life, I have spent three years in a tent. And uh, of course, I got recalled, so I've got more time than what I had with the uh, 10th Mountain Division. But no, I, I prefer to be out in the field. I, I'm not a garrison soldier. Did you perceive training as difficult? You, a lot of people thought training was difficult, and we listened to them. But when you lived through the Depression years, and uh, some of the fellows that came into the Army at that time, not the 10th, but into the Army at that time, had never known a new pair of shoes or shoes. Uh, so we were all tuned in to making do with what you had. So most of us, the Army was a pretty good deal. Plenty of food. I gained 20 pounds in the first three months. And, you know, you toughened right up. And you felt good. Did you have a sense being in the 10th Mountain Division that the 10th was special? Oh, not as much as we do now. Uh, was the Spanish, did we feel that the, uh, the 10th was special while we were in it? Yes. We had good publicity. And they called us ski troopers. And they had, they even made a movie at Camp Hale. And I think the star was Jinx Falkenberg. Now, can you remember her? No. Not many do, but, well, the old timers will remember. Uh, yeah, we knew we were special, but we, when we went into town, we were not allowed to take any of our equipment with us or to dress differently to, or to do anything that was not a government regulation. Now, the Air Force, when they started to train them in mountains on survival and, uh, We'd see them with our clothes on downtown, strutting around, and that made us mad because they weren't mountain troops. They were. They were the Air Force. Talk a little, Corps, by the way. Uh, talk a little bit about the camaraderie that you guys felt between each other at camp, at Hale. 
The camaraderie that we had at Camp Hale was embryonic because you really don't get to it until you've been shot at. Fox old buddies, they call you. Uh, sure, you were in climbing and you you worked together, you did have it, but uh, it wasn't that strong feeling that you got when you went to combat. Well, how did the training pull the men together? Just because you're doing it. When you're, when you're working with someone uh, with the same objective in mind, yes. But we had our, our rivalries and, and things, and of course some people wanted to get more stripes, and it was the usual things that you got in civilian life. But when you go to combat, a lot of that changes. Then you realize that your buddy, you're fighting for his life as well as your own. You're working for that. And how did that breed tighten up the camaraderie between men then? When we went to combat? Oh, altogether different. Real tight. It's still going on today. When you see all, and you know, I can meet some old timer from some division that I didn't even know about, because there were about a hundred divisions in World War II. And we can sit down and start talking, and you do have a camaraderie right there. Because you know, you can understand what he's been through. And this is why that many soldiers don't talk about it to someone that hasn't been there. Because they can't explain it. There's no way you can tell anybody what, what it was like. So, camaraderie is uh, most essential. Oh, you've got some eight balls, but the uh, most of them know. Most of them are they are not selfish. That's one of the things, and they know that uh, they're working together with their buddy. And of course, they all lose. We all lost friends of the. 900 and some odd killed in the division. I knew 90 of them on a first name basis because of having been with MTG and, and 10th Recon. We were split up and sent to the rifle companies. Well, we hadn't been training as riflemen. So, and a lot of them carried rank. I was probably, as a buck sergeant, I was about as low on the totem pole as, as there was. Rank didn't matter. Now, because you weren't trained as a medic, what was it like for you in Italy to be a medic? What, well, like, to go on, because I wasn't trained as a medic, but I was given 18 mules and three horses. So I, and you know, you're around it all the time. But as far as actually treating like a surgical tech or a medical tech, no. But you had those men that were there and you could turn to them and say, you know, here's your patient, and what can I do to help you? And you learn, it's on the job training. Why don't you talk a little bit about what it was like to be a medic in Italy? What was it like to be a medic? Number one, why did I join the medics? Uh, the main reason that I joined was that I didn't want to kill anybody. I had no desire, I was raised that, you know, you don't do those things. I'm not a hunter. I'll hunt if I need food, but you don't go out to hunt for sport. And to kill somebody, there's no sport for that. There's no need. And I've talked with infantrymen, and their reaction is, you don't want to know. And when you look somebody in the eye and then kill them, it's pretty horrible, and it's something they don't forget. Uh, of course, a lot of the time it was long distance. So I joined the medic so that I could help rather than hurt. What was it like? It was satisfying. Uh, I enjoyed the atmosphere that you, that you had in a medical group because those people were, they were there to help other people. Now, I had a, a litter section 
out of a collecting company. And we would go out on a push. They'd tell us where the patient was. And General Hayes had us working from the aid station forward. So we'd go up, we'd pick up the patient, bring him back, and uh, we wouldn't see him again. There, we'd be treated at the aid station and then go on back from there. Uh, so you're actually out on the battlefield collecting patients? Yes, you go to the battlefield. As a collecting company, it was unlike the medic that goes with the company. Company aid man goes right from day one. And we didn't have any weapons. We had no defense, except the Red Cross that you got on your helmet. And uh, you hoped that the Germans would respect that, honor it. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. Depended on the individual. And to be honest, it's the same way with what our troops did. I know some of our boys, I've even had one brag that he shot a German medic. Well, that man is a misfit. So I've been between the lines when I could have been shot. And when I came back up over the hill, I was looking at the wrong end of the American rifles. Everybody, 